Peter Iltis is the reason I'm here. He's professor of kinesiology mm -hmm. at Gordon College in Massachusetts and also a horn player, which means he can now explain in horn player's terms what exactly is a professor of kinesiology. Yes, not many people know. And uh, basically kinesiology is the study of human movement. We're interested in how movement is produced and what it does. And in music, we perform by executing human movements. In fact, I would say it's very hard to find anything that you cannot say is involving human movement. So how do the movements that we produce allow us to make the music that we make? That's the kind of question I'm interested in. That's why you asked me to come here. You're mm -hmm. going to put me into a tube oh, yes. and make me play a horn. Yes. Uh, this horn, mm -hmm. which looks very different to my normal horn, um, because uh, no metal is allowed in the MRI. That's correct. That's correct. Actually, no metal that's, that's magnetic. And so this is a very specially designed bell, which has a very high proportion of copper and zinc. And it's non-ferromagnetic, so it doesn't get attracted by the big magnet in the Otherwise, horn. if it had been metal, it would have flown big into trouble. the... Okay, big trouble. So if we took your horn, it has metal attachments as well. Yeah. That they, they would also give us problems. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, and then this, this goes... Uh, this is outside, and this goes inside, right. and I'm going to play it on my back That's in right. the thing. Okay, well, I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> this is a very unique horn. Uh, Richard Serafinov at Indiana University built this for us. And it's basically a natural horn in E-flat, so the length of the tubing is made just like that. Okay, so. I'm looking forward to trying that out and seeing if I can get any notes out. How did you get this idea of testing horn players? Well, testing horn players in general has always been something I've been interested in. I, I have developed a disorder called uh, embouchure dystonia, where the muscles that control the embouchure have been affected. And so I had an interest to find out ways that we could look at this and study it more carefully. Eckhart Altenmüller, whom you're going to be speaking to, I guess, later, uh, invited me to come to Hanover, where he said they were doing filming in a magnetic resonance imaging chamber of horn players and brass players, so that we could actually see inside their mouth and get an idea of what's going on with the tongue and inside the mouth, the cavity of the mouth. And my goal was to learn as much as I could about that uh, in studying the disorder of dystonia. But in order to do that, we have to decide what is optimal. And so the idea of testing elite horn players was born so that we could have something to compare to a benchmark example that we could compare to. Elite horn players, that's an yes, honor. Yes, indeed. Oh my goodness, that's <laughs> not, you've tested a few people. And um, what, what exactly do you see in there? Well, we see a picture of you from several angles. The first is from the side, and that allows us to see uh, the tongue in particular, the oral cavity inside the mouth. We can actually see other parts of your face. In fact, anything that's made out of soft tissue, we can image on an MRI. Do, do we really want to see this? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> sure. Well, one of, the, one of the ideas is that there are things that we do inside our mouth that make us efficient in producing sound. And so if we can identify what those things are and perhaps study them in comparison to dystonia people, perhaps we'll see something that will help us to know why they've developed the disorder or how we might be able to prevent it. That's it's not only about disorders. I mean, it's a great thing to be able to, to help people who have had this, who have this disorder. By, but isn't it a little bit difficult to say, okay, you've got a problem now, you have to do it like them because they can play the horn. Um, is it, can you use this information for other things? Sure, and I think that, that that's very important um, in teaching, in pedagogy. We have a lot of things as teachers that we tell students that we do or that they should do and actually without really knowing what those things are, we may not be saying exactly what happens. And so if we can learn things from these films that will help us in our teaching to better uh, illuminate the kinds of things that we do, what we want them to do, that's helpful to them. And it may actually uh, provide them with more efficient ways of doing things as well. Is there a danger, and I am speaking for myself, because sure. I'm a, a little bit worried about going to a tube anyway, but also maybe about knowing too much. You know there's a, the, the, the boy who knew too much. Right. Um, thinking too much about what's going on in the, the, all the muscles. I mean, it's the same with, with sports people. They, sure. they, they use, they have to know exactly what they're doing, but when they're out there on the football pitch, they don't think, okay, you know, they, right. when we're on stage, we go out there and we do it. That's right. And I think that's very important. And, and many teachers of horn that I've spoken to have said, how are you going to use this information? I don't think that we necessarily are trying to learn all of the movements that occur so that we can tell a student move this two centimeters to the left or a millimeter to the right. I think the idea is to come up with general principles that are actually what happens. And then we have to learn as teachers to bring that into some concrete idea that they can employ. 
Um, and I can talk about some of those if you'd like. Yes, no, please, tell me. Well, for example, um, one of the things that we're seeing in, in you find players is that the tongue makes some very distinct movements as you move from the lower register to the high register. Now, this is not completely new information, but we are seeing it in a very detailed way. Well, if we can convey that to a student by saying something like, well, for example, when you play low, think about forming the vowel O, having your tongue low in your mouth, dropping your jaw. We all talk about that as horn players, but now we can say, think about making an O, and then as you come higher, think about changing the vowel sound more to something like E. We'll see that. Do you will indeed. In fact, uh, we have some oh good pictures of many horn players <laughs> like that. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Uh, wow. Yeah. So that becomes an easy thing to hook onto for a student, vowels throughout the range of the instrument. But, it, but is it, does it help them to visualize it when they see these pictures? Would you, show, would you sit a, a student down and say, look at these pictures? Yes, I would. <laughs> uh, I don't know that everyone would, but I think that it's helpful to see, you know, to actually see this is what happens. And uh, to be able to associate that with something simple is, uh, that's, that's the task. Is this a general thing? Because, I mean, I, I don't think that in horn playing, one size fits all. I think everybody does what they need to do. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're seeing in the pictures of horn players you've tested, maybe you're seeing that they're all doing similar things. Yeah. This is a big challenge. And in fact, when I first proposed testing elite players, a lot of, a lot of challenges came my way. Elite players have developed many different ways of doing things, and they're not all the same. And so Most I, of them don't know even how well, they do them. It's true, <laughs> and probably, probably not a bad idea to not know in some cases. But um, the idea that we are doing is basically we're exploring many, many exercises in many different horn players. And essentially, we're looking at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images and trying to look for patterns, generalizable patterns that we can see. What have you found? What sort of patterns? Well, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll ruin them all today. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, as I said, one of the patterns we've seen is this kind of tongue movement in a simple exercise of playing harmonics from the very low part of the horn to the high part of the horn. Uh, that is consistent across our fine players. And interestingly enough, it has not been consistent as we've looked at dystonic horn players. And so one begins to ask, well, why are they doing it differently? Is that something that's contributed to the problem? Why are they doing it differently? I don't know. Do the muscles do it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the problem in dystonia is one uh, loses the ability to discriminate senses that they have, feelings that they have coming to them from the outside, and processing that in a way that allows them to move correctly. There's a lot of input that comes into our brains to tell us what to do. We have to sort through that and our brains have to make a decision about how our movement is going to occur. And in dystonia, this becomes very confused. Um, what causes that is a huge question. We don't know the answer to that. But it's possible that part of it may be uh, improper practicing techniques, actual physical procedures that are repeated over and over and over again that become uh, habitual problems. Yeah. Goodness, well... So you're helping to elucidate and help the horn players learn about that. Well, I'm really looking forward, to, I'm looking forward to doing that. I'm not so much looking forward to going in the tube, but um, I'm fascinated to see what's going to come out. Yeah, so good, uh, good. let's go downstairs and, and see. Sounds perfect. Yeah. Let's go. Yep. Get this end to blow in. You got that right. Good. Okay. Excellent. A little bit of water in there. We'll get it. We'll get that, yeah, that conversation. That you see, well. what happens is when you blow warm air down tubing, there gets a lot of conden condensation in there. So we have to empty it out. Otherwise, it gurgles. Exactly. How on earth do you... Well, we have a way of doing that downstairs. We'll show you later. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is... Uh, yeah, we need to get the water out of your horn. There are no valves on here to empty it. But so we have to just blow it through. And there so you, you have it. So you think... So you think Shall I try? Yeah, please do. <laughs> but I wonder if it would work. No, I... You can do it. I mean, it won't hurt your arm. I'll just be careful of the lead pipe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Waterless, a spitless horn. Hooray! Very good.